Britain uh, basically led the making of the modern world as we know it through the British Empire, which brought modern institutions, democracy, joint stock companies, railways, uh, vaccinations, uh, all sorts of uh, modernizations to most of the world. So I think Britain has a lot to be proud about. Of course, there were things that uh, were, were went wrong. Of course, there was the occasional um, sort of um, loss of life in wars. Uh, you know, these are things that happen in, in everyone's history. So I think Britain has much less to be ashamed of than most other great powers and a lot more to be proud of. Hello, I'm Darren Grimes and welcome to Reasoned, the channel that asks you to think more and follow less. Please do consider hitting that subscribe button and the notification bell if you enjoy today's content. Reasoned is entirely fan funded, so it, there's a link in that description to support us if you're in a position to do so. Now, as you're likely already aware, since the Black Lives Matter protests of last year, it's safe to conclude that the culture wars and the war on Western history have been ramped up a gear. It seems every taxpayer-funded organisation with an acronym these days is in a rush to declare itself systemically racist, in a rush to self-flagellate itself and pander to those seeking to apply the moral standards of 2021 to everyone from our past. Now, many have asked what can be done to combat this assault on our past and indeed our present in challenging those who seek to dismiss Great Britain's past and, well, an independent group of scholars from seven countries, an eclectic bunch, and I don't mean that to sound offensive folks, from a wide range of opinions, they've actually come together, united under the banner of reclaiming history. Now, this group argues that history requires careful interpretation of often complex evidence and challenge the use of it as a propaganda vehicle that ultimately seeks to denigrate and destroy. The group will aim to inform individuals and institutions under attack in an age of an especially pronounced culture war. Well, I'm delighted to say that joining me to discuss the project and the latest attempts to besmirch Britain is Dr. Zaria Masani, an author and broadcaster, and Emma Webb, co-founder of Save Our Statues and a commentator and broadcaster. Hello to both of you. Hello, Darren. Good to be with now, you. Zaria, can I start with you? I want to start by asking what you think explains, especially in academia, there seems to be, doesn't there, this very biased interpretation of Britain's role in the world and its history. I mean, when you have the likes of Churchill College at Cambridge University, for example, hosting a panel on the wartime leader, that's made up, Zaria, exclusively of those who clearly vehemently despise the man and are keen to trash his reputation and the way in which we think of him as a national treasure. What do you think explains the capture of these institutions in such a way? Well, I think what's happened, Darren, is two things have converged. One is that left liberal academics have been gradually taking over academia so that there's much less diversity, although they claim diversity, within academia than there was in my time. And there's very much a culture of being on the politically correct, cor uh, the politically correct left liberal side of every argument. That line of intellectual uh, development has coincided with this very um, sort of uh, direct action oriented Black Lives Movement, which has no academic credentials whatsoever, but actually has merged with the left liberal uh, white apologists for it. And they are determined to eradicate um, everything they deem politically incorrect. The college was f founded in memory of Churchill, endowed by his family, mm. and bears his name. The master of the Churchill College is a lady called Athena Donald, and she commissioned um, an event chaired by Dr. Priyambada Gopal, who is a notorious Churchill hater, in fact, everything to do with white Britain hater, and two other people who were also Churchill haters. And this was meant to be a panel to discuss 
Churchill's legacy. Not a single person who thought he might have been a, a good idea or had anything to recommend him. And they trashed his reputation. They had it on YouTube. They spent an hour and a half doing this, ignored complaints from people like myself and Andrew Roberts, and later had to apologize to Churchill's family when they complained to the governing body of the college. Mm. It's, I mean, that is extraordinary, isn't it, Emma? I, I mean, in the context of universities, I wonder to what extent you could argue that they used to be these sort of glorified debating chambers in which lecturers and students alike would challenge each other, I dare say, through those ancient tools of, God forbid, speech and debate. But that seems to all be lost, really, in the age of cancel culture. Those that want to seek to to challenge the narrative that Britain is nothing more than some, I guess, racist backwater, perhaps fear ultimately for their jobs and, and degrees and are found to self-censor themselves in perhaps their more nuanced views and opinions on our past, including Sir Winston Churchill. Yeah, I think it is extraordinary, but it's also sadly very unsurprising because universities have undergone this fall from glory, I suppose you would say, this extraordinary fall from grace. Uh, it's the reason why the government has had to put fo put forward this uh, new proposed legislation, the Freedom um, Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill, which uh, actually just had some legislation as uh, the the evidence session was um today and um professor nigel bigger who's also involved with reclaim history gave some evidence in that as well um and i think that really is testament to the sad state of affairs that really our universities don't have a diversity of opinion anymore there is so much pressure enforced by the intellectual orthodoxy coming mm -hmm. from the left particularly um, that there's no room to breathe. The oxygen has been completely sucked out of the room. And it's a, a horrible, toxic mix, I think, of different tides. There's a sort of nihilism, this destructiveness, um, the loss of self-confidence that has been ongoing since probably even before the Second World War. I think we've been gradually losing our self-confidence as a nation. Mm. Um, and then this has been really, I suppose you could say, hijacked by activists who, as you, you mentioned earlier, um, you alluded to a quote from um, Robert Toombs about this project. And he said that history requires careful interpretation of complex evidence and must not be a vehicle for facile propaganda. And I think that what we see in universities and elsewhere as well, as you mentioned, in all of our institutions, in hospitals, museums, um, educational institutions, all of those who are supposed to be the custodians of our heritage and intellectual treasures, as well as our material, cultural treasures, have been sort of um, infested by this facile propaganda, this um, very one-dimensional way of understanding our history through a particular lens. And I think it's incredibly destructive, and I don't actually think that you can overstate the consequences of that for a culture and for a people. Mm -hmm. I mean, Zaria, if I ask you to, to, to sort of do the job of reclaiming history right now, I mean, one lesser known example than perhaps Sir Winston Churchill of a, of a statue under siege, I guess, would be the one of Robert Clive in Whitehall. He founded Britain's Indian Empire. Now, he's been labelled, and you wrote about this in The Times, he's been labelled a murderer, plunderer, a social psychopath. And you actually say that... Uh, I guess, historical reality was quite different. And I wonder if you might set out now how you would go about challenging that narrative and, and I guess, reclaim history. Well, to take the Clive example, Clive was someone who might well have been a hero for our own times because he was a completely self-made man from a very modest uh, rural background who as you say, was one of the founders of the British Empire in India, rose from this obscure basis to becoming one of the uh, wealthiest, most powerful people in Britain, and uh, was very much um, also a, a, a man for our times in having major mental health problems, which Prince Harry, you know, has made so popular these days. So uh, today, you know, Clive would be absolutely in the ascendant, but he's being attacked and reviled 
for having um, plundered and looted. I mean, he took war booty. He rose from fairly modest origins to becoming wealthy, so he was looked down on as nouveau riche by the old Whig aristocracy. So that was blatant prejudice, which today's uh, left-wingers have taken on. And he's blamed basically for having got rich and for having founded the British Empire. Uh, his personal struggles with mental health, etc., are ignored. His success is ignored. And there are moves to remove his statue in Whitehall, which I think belongs to the Foreign Office. Mm. So I think what we're trying to do in Reclaim History is very much to counter this narrative where history has been weaponized by Black Lives Matter and their white apologies. And what we're saying is history is a complex um, uh, past which we all share. We need to discuss it. We need to be very open about it. And we need to get away from this idea that legacies from the past, whether they're statues or road names or other monuments, somehow have to be eradicated because we disapprove of the people who built them or in whose memory they were put up. We live in an age when we have different values from what people did 200 years ago. That doesn't mean we have any right to cancel those people. So History Reclaimed is about reclaiming history and about showing its complexity and trying to uh, show people that it is it has its own values. Every age has its own values, its own culture, and we mustn't impose ours. Mm. And Emma, I guess an example for you, if I ask you to, to do the same thing, London's Goldsmith university for example is considering removing sir francis drake and lord nelson statues and guys and st thomas's nhs trust have actually decided to go ahead haven't they and remove a statue of the founder of guys hospital because of his links to to slavery how would you go about challenging those claims and perhaps saying to these institutions of the state in fact that that it's wrong to to remove these things but actually, there's been a third example that's been reported just today, which is another ah. perfect, perfect example of how this isn't based, um, as you say, on the, the actual facts of history, the complexity of history, but is based on the perception of what some of these people assume some people, visitors in a museum, for example, might take offence at. Um, and this is the um, uh, a figurehead from the front of a ship um, from uh, a, a figurehead of George III. And uh, the National Maritime Museum have just taken this off of display and replaced it with um, a plaque at say, saying that it could be construed as being offensive through links to slavery because he's flanked by two African figures, even though the figurehead is to do with the battle was made after the Battle of Waterloo, has nothing to do with slavery. There's no reason to believe that other than being entirely based in perception. Um, and uh, you mentioned Thomas Guy, um, who is an, another figure who I think most people probably would never have heard of before this entire statue row broke out. Um, Thomas Guy was uh, an in incredible, incredibly generous philanthropist who had shares in the South Sea Company. Um, and he bequeathed a portion of his estate to treating um, those with uncur uh, incurable health problems, which became uh, Guy's Hospital, which now is Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. There's another statue of um, Sir Robert Clayton, uh, which is also at, uh, then uh, also at the um, hospital, but it's in a less prominent position, so they've decided not to move it. And now this statue of uh, Thomas Guy is actually listed, so it's in a prominent mm -hmm. position. It's been there since uh, 10 years after his death. And um, it's something that is often forgotten about these statues is that they are also works of art. So this is by a, a sculptor who also made a famous sculpture of, um, of William Shakespeare that stands in Westminster Abbey. Um, and this is a, a, an artist who had a 50 year career. And so this is, this is also a work of art that is being sort of relegated to a less prominent position as well. Um, and I, I was reading today that it seems that actually even um, Thomas Guy's shares in the South Sea Company were acquired in a in a slightly confusing way. And now I'm not a, a historian, so I'm not really 
fully qualified, I think, to explain the e- economics of how he came to acquire those shares in the South Sea Company. But it certainly seems to have been quite indirect. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously, he made some profits from that that then went into his uh, estate. Um, n- not his entire estate, it formed a, a portion of that. And then he bequeathed that to the founding of the hospital. And so obviously, for obvious reasons, um, his endowment is important to the hospital's history. Um, and the hospital then, um, st- uh, at the, when the Black Lives Matter protest kicked off, they applied for planning permission to have this statue removed the public said no they then decided that they were going to wait until they could get a more favorable outcome um and this process has been ongoing they did a survey of um the public's opinion and found that 75 percent wanted to keep the statue where it was they've then decided to ignore that um Mm. their legal advice has been that actually uh they can't they're not reasonably legally going to be able to remove this. Oliver Dowden has already spoken, the culture secretary has already spoken out against it. So what they're doing is they're committing themselves to an expensive legal fight to remove this statue that they know that they won't really be able to remove. It's very unlikely that they'll succeed. Um, And a senior source in the foundation that runs the hospital has said that they are or will essentially be chipping into their endowment in order to fight this legal battle, money that should be going on curing patients. Um, and this senior source in the foundation has said that they're committing themselves to this impossible legal battle just to prove their uh, woke credentials, essentially. Mm. It's I, very sad. It, it is, actually. <laughs> Zaria, do you think, speaking of the sort of, I guess, democratic uh, accountability of keeping a statue, do you think there's ever a, were there to be a vote, for example, on a statue that goes against said statue? Do you think then there is license to remove a statue or do you always think actually you cannot mess with history like that? Where, where do you sort of stand? I think when we're talking about mass murderers like Hitler or Stalin or Mao or Saddam Hussein, it is perfectly okay for the majority of a population to pull down their statues. But I think if we're talking about people who had links with slavery, I think we need to recognize firstly that there were extensive links because slavery was very much part of the city of London uh, as it was across the world. I think we forget that there was a global slave trade. There were slave markets in the Arab world and in Turkey and India and China long after the British abolished slavery and the British Navy actually tried to patrol that and put an end to it. So slavery was very much also an African phenomenon. Africans enslaved each other and they sold each other into slavery. So if we're going to go after anyone who had links with slavery, we'd need to virtually become cosmopolitan on this. The UN needs to do it. Uh, Secondly, I think you mentioned Oliver Dowden, and I think the government is, um, you know, belatedly fighting back on this. We, we are waiting for this measure which Dowden promised us. It hasn't come yet. But in any case, historic England have a right to object to these uh, changes in what are effectively planning law. And so Oliver Dowden can certainly come in as Secretary of State at the end of the process. And much the same has happened with the Rhodes statue. You must be aware of Cecil Rhodes statue Mm -hmm. in Oxford, which all these demonstrations tried to remove. And the college has now said they won't because the government won't allow them to anyway. So they're hiding behind the government, but it will stay. And I think I agree with Emma. I think the um, Guy statue and the Clayton statue will remain uh, exactly where they are. But as you say, as Emma said, a huge amount of money is being wasted on this yeah. time and effort and litigation, which should, as Emma said, be going to the purposes for which these uh, charities were set up. Hmm. Uh, Emma, do you think there's a role for the sort of retain and explain approach of statues that some have argued for, where perhaps instead of replacing a statue outright, you put up a plaque that has some information uh, but doesn't stop short of removing a statue outright. Yeah, I was uh, initially I was quite optimistic about retain and explain because of the retain element. Um, what I 
was slightly naive about which has come to pass is the explain part can e be equally as biased and i think there's a discussion taking place at the moment about the extent to which those plaques that are being put on statues are also biased misleading they look at figures through only one lens through a biased or politicized lens um and i think a very important point was just alluded to there which is that all of these historical figures can be made to be problematic when you're following the reasoning of some of these activists. So we saw in the British Library, in the British Museum, in the Natural History Museum, everything from busts of Mendelssohn to paintings of cotton on the ceiling of the Natural History Museum being seen as problematic. Beethoven and Mendelssohn, because classical music was viewed as being white supremacist. Um, even the building itself of, of the um, British Library being viewed as problematic because it's in the shape of a ship, which obviously has naval connotations and the Navy was involved in, in slavery, although the Navy was also involved in suppressing the slave trade. But through an increasingly abstract set of steps, you can make any historical figure problematic. You can make any current figure, any individual problematic um, because no individual is perfect, no society is perfect and history is extremely complex and the individuals who make history are complex um, and so I think that there is a problem with retain and explain in that it lends itself to the same politicization it lends itself to the same one-dimensional historical approach that is to some degree with some of these historical figures defamatory and um, Churchill and Rhodes are two examples of people for whom quotes have simply been made up and then have spread like memes like wildfire Andrew Roberts it was explaining in a video with Stephen Edgington at the Telegraph recently some of the way that some of those quotes that are peddled in relation to Churchill are just simply not things that he ever said the same is true with Rhodes fictional statements that were were written written um, by detractors becoming um, reasons for viewing these figures in a particular light. And so I think that the explain part of the retain and explain policy has problems of its own. And um, I'm very much a fan of the idea of putting just more statues into the public space. I like the fact that our public space is pluralistic. So you can have Charles I in a face off with Oliver Cromwell in Westminster. Mm. You can have um, the leader of South Africa that we fought against in the Boer War in Parliament Square alongside Churchill. Um, I think that that is, is, a, is an important aspect of our public space. But what we're seeing now is that this retain and explain um, idea is being taken and used in a political way so sky arts are doing this project at the moment in liverpool where they're dressing up statues they're dressing up statues in elizabethan ruffs made of um fabrics from um formerly imperial countries they are uh, dressing up statues of queen victoria they dressed um william gladstone in a pan-african flag um, and i think that the the interpretations that are being given to these statues are equally as um activist as you know, those who just simply wanted to tear them down. Now, I think obviously anything is preferable to actually destroying heritage uh, or vandalizing heritage, but it doesn't mean that it's something that is, you know, inherently unobjectionable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Zaria, how would you quote unquote, I guess, if we speak about ordinary people, how would you get them to, to care about this stuff? Because it's just a lot of, a lot of people might be thinking, oh, Darren, here you go again. If this is just a lot of academics and Marxist millennials arguing over a lot of stuff that doesn't really matter. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, on social media, I think a very wide range of people and in organizations like Save Our Statues go well beyond our media people or our academic people. So I think it, it's, it's something that does concern the ordinary public very much. And I think that's what's so undemocratic about it. And I agree with Emma that, you know, uh, I also initially thought retain and explain was a good idea. But the more I see of the plaques that are explaining, the more I feel that they're actually um, sort of badges of shame that are being hung on people which prejudice anyone who's going to look at these statues. So if you see a statue of Clive or of uh, Lord Melville in Edinburgh saying these were people who had links with the empire and with killing lots of people, um, lots of people died in, in wars around them. I mean, you immediately prejudice the viewer 
and the casual viewer isn't going to go and research it for themselves. So I think the plaques, in my view, need to be as minimal and factual as possible. And I think people should be allowed to do their own research, to make up their own minds. And if they don't like a statue, move on. No one's telling you you have to look at it. And I'm also very amused by this idea I see in the report on the Guy statue, for instance, which recommended that it should be moved, that basically it was interfering with the hospital's current job because it was offending people through its links with slavery, which is absolutely absurd. You, you know, as Emma said, the hospital is being diverted from its current job by this whole um, you know, process that it's having to go through and is insisting on fighting. So uh, really, I think, yes, I think uh, uh, the, the less explanation we have, the better. And I think the sooner the government puts through this legislation it has promised, the better, and people can then move on. And as Emma said, if we want more statues, we want more diversity, we can add them. If we feel there's a one-sided view being given on one side of a, of a square, we can present another without having to sort of tell the public what they should think. This mm -hmm. is very much rather the kind of thing you expect in communist countries. People should be told what to think about what they see. I thought in democracies we don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Emma, I wonder if you take that same question actually and think about how you... Uh, or do you not think there needs to be a need to encourage quote unquote ordinary people to to care about something like statue, for example? I don't think that ordinary people need to be encouraged to. I think they do. In fact, the groundswell behind Save Our Statues was ordinary people. And whenever you see um, these consultations, the public by a large majority are in favour of leaving statues where they are. And when they're talking about plaques, it's only a very, very small minority of people who are even in favour of plaques being put there. Most of the time it's, you know, 75, 71%. I'm thinking of the City of London when they were talking about removing some statues um, within the City of London. The consultation found that 71% of people wanted to leave them in situ. So the public are absolutely in favour of leaving their heritage where it is. I, I'm think, thinking particularly of um, the uh, gentleman who came out to defend um, Barden Powell's statue in Paul uh, quite a while ago now, but and that was a, a sort of heroic em attempt of the people of Paul to fight people off, to leave their statue alone. They wanted it to stay put and they succeeded in doing that as far as I'm aware. Um, and I think just to go back to um, a point that was made there briefly, it reminds me of the quote, um, live not by lies. Um, and there's an element of an attack on reality in what we're seeing here, an attack on the, na the nature of history and the nature of, you know, who we are now and how we as individuals move through history. There's a sort of hubris about it that you know, you are never going to agree with every statue that's put up, particularly because, as I, as I say, we have a pluralistic public space where statues were put up by subscription of people of different groups with different concerns from different political parties and different um, with different agendas, I suppose you'd say. I don't want to use their own language there. Um, and so you'll never find yourself in agreement with all of the statues in the United Kingdom, specifically because we are not the Soviet Union. These are not top down statues art that has been enforced on us with a particular narrative there's a, a mixture of things um, and so i think that the fact that those sorts of things stand in tension with each other i think that that is very has a very important social effect on people who encounter statues and who who encounter art in the public space because you are seeing history standing in tension because that is what history is it's something that is not flat it's not flush it's not perfect it's complicated and it's patchy um, and I think it, that that has an important effect on people and, and should remind them not to have this hubris and this arrogance that they are right, that they are so um, uh, sort of uh, correct in their current thinking that they are able to decide how to edit the public space, that they are able to enforce their views on others and to crush dissent. And I think that that is something that is very important and it has an important social effect. And so I think that actually that that is one of, for me, one of the key reasons why it's important that these sorts of um, activist narratives 
are confronted with fact. They should be allowed, of course, to express their views, but people also have to be allowed to correct them with facts and to have those discussions and to have those conversations. Um, because I think that we're at risk really of, of losing ourself, um, losing ourselves as a society in all of this um, activism and all of this uproar about the culture war. Mm. Uh, Darren, I would just like to add something on this question of slavery, which has become, you know, rather a cult to kind mm -hmm. of attack anything that has a connection with the transatlantic slave trade. But we ignore the fact that there was a global slave trade, which is still going on. Uh, the nine and a half million people are in modern slavery in Africa. Now, why aren't people going and demonstrating about that? Why aren't they attacking Nigerian um, billionaires who thrive on this kind of thing? Uh, Arabs who are actually still importing slaves. So, you know, the, this, the f figure I've given you is from the Global Slavery Index, which is run by the International Labour Organization. So it's not one I've just plucked out of the air. Nine and a half million people in Africa. You know, how many people are in slavery in Britain? So it's completely out of all proportion to what's going on in the world today. And I have to say, I can't see how slavery that was 200 years old is something that is somehow something we have to address for the sake of descendants of those people 200 years later, many of whom have chosen to come and live in Britain and benefit from British industry, uh, the welfare state, um, the opportunities here. Why are we asking them to pay taxes for us to address slavery that happened 200 years ago? The whole thing is, is quite crazy. Now, I wonder if to end, I'm, I'm going to put you both on the spot ever so slightly. And uh, so I apologise for that in advance. And I, I wonder if, if, you, if you had to, in a sentence or two, I guess, sum up the nuances of Britain's history and role in global history. How might you do it? Because presumably you wouldn't describe it as a hateful cesspit of slavery and villainy, would you, Zaria? No, I certainly wouldn't. I think Britain uh, basically led the making of the modern world as we know it through the British Empire, which brought modern institutions democracy, joint stock companies, railways, uh, vaccinations, uh, all sorts of uh, modernizations to most of the world. So I think Britain has a lot to be proud about. Of course, there were things that uh, were, were went wrong. Of course, there was the occasional um, sort of um, loss of life in wars. Uh, you know, these are things that happen in, in everyone's history. So I think Britain has much less to be ashamed of than most other great powers and a lot more to be proud of. Mm -hmm. Emma? Well, I think it's, it's very difficult to do. And I think similarly, you know, we have an awful lot to be proud of. Of course, there are things historically that, you know, we've done wrong. There are plenty of a litany of historical mistakes that you could say. Um, I don't believe in judging previous times by today's standards because I think that, that that history occurred to bring us to the point at which we're currently at. And so um, you have to see things within the context of the, the fact that we have arrived at this point in history because of those ancestors and because of because of the, the zeitgeist of previous times. Um, it's a point that has been made by um, Giles Udi and others, which is that um, you know, yes, we were involved in slavery, but towards the end of uh, of the empire, we became what was known as an anti-slavery state, and we also did a, a lot of good in suppressing the slave trade. Um, and you know, I I think it's right that we have a a very honest, rigorous fact fact factual approach to our history. But I also don't think it's healthy to denigrate ourselves in the way that we have done for decades yeah. now, actually. And I think that we have an awful lot to be proud of. You know, the common law, um, our, our in great institutions, our art, our literature. I mean, the, I could sit here and list for yes. hours things that we should be proud of. Um, but that is just because we love our own country. That is not to say that we are, you know, elevating ourselves above others. I think that 
you know, patriotism has become a sort of dirty word. Um, but, you know, there are other countries have lots to be proud of as well. And so do we. And I think that there's absolutely no shame in saying so. Well, thank you both so much for joining me today. Zaria, if people want to find out more about the, the project and indeed sign up to the newsletter, they can do so at historyreclaim.co.uk. What else would you actually encourage them to do if after watching this, they're, you know, sat there ready to throw their keyboard out of the window at the sort of temerity of these activists? What else can they do? I would say people should lobby their MPs and Oliver Dowden to actually put his money where his mouth is and bring in this legislation which he promised us some time ago, which would put a stop, I think, to a lot of this lunacy that's going on. That's great. Emma, thank you very much as well for joining me. Where can people find out more about Save Our Statues? Um, oh dear, I'm not going to be able to remember the name of the website off the top of my head, am I? I'll have to send it to you afterwards the, so you can pop it on the screen. Send it, yeah, I'll <laughs> pop it in the link yeah, in the we, description. We have a website. It'll be there, it'll be there. All right, thank you again, both of you. Thank now, you, Darren. Thank a you. big thanks to all of you, especially for joining at home. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. I'm sure you did. If you did, please like and share. And Reasoned, as the channel that asks you to think more and follow less, is entirely fan-funded. So there's a link in the description to support us if you're in a position to do so. Cheers very much, and I'll see you next time. Reasoned relies upon grassroots donations from people like yourself that want us to continue producing our high quality free thinking content. So please do consider clicking the link and donating no matter how big, no matter how small, because it really does ensure that we can keep on keeping on.